So you want to start a farm. It's sort of a um, sarcastic uh, title. I'm going to skip my background since we're cut out in time. Basically, I've been in farming and industry and technology for a long time. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> so we get a lot of people that uh, come to our uh, dome greenhouse. This is the um, UConn School of Agriculture. They come uh, once or twice a year uh, for their stu studies. And we also give a lot of tours to uh, different groups at our place. And um, it's really, you have to ask why you want to start uh, a business. Um, and there's many reasons, and there can be a combination of this, um, you know, for profit. You can have a nonprofit group. Um, if you just want to do it for a hobby or self-reliance. It's not really business at that point. Um, educational use or research and development. At our place, um, we obviously like to be for profit, but we do spend a lot of time uh, doing educational and um, I do a lot of research and development. We do um, some technology work. Um, we developed like the, the grow grips. You've got those in your little packets. Um, we did that a few years ago. Um, so this uh, smaller greenhouse is really a, a proving ground for a lot of the technology that we uh, try to work with. Um, so really, what, when you're starting a business, you, know, you want to figure out how you're going to reach your goal. And, um, I get a lot of people come in, and the best example is um, in, our, in the New England area, we have a lot of abandoned old mill buildings. And I had somebody come and say, we just leased on a five-year lease, you know, 10,000 square feet of this mill building, and we're going to set up an aquaponics system. But it's like, well, all right, that's great, but what are you going to be growing in there? Well, we haven't decided that yet. Or what are you going to, um, you know, how are you going to fit all this into your building? Well, we haven't come up with a design yet, and they're already locked into a lease. So, you know, and um, Ryan touched on this earlier. He mentioned a couple times about, you know, the business plan. And, and that's really important. I'll you know, say it again. You should really have a business plan in place. You know, and not just something in your head saying, we want to do this and this and this, and it's going to cost me this much money. Come up with a plan, and I can't stress it enough. Get it in writing, write it down and um, follow what your plan is. And it will help to keep you on, on, on the path. And it really helps you from uh, uh, going off track of what your end result is. And with that um, warehouse space, or the mill space that that person had, it was actually on the second floor of a building. Um, they didn't even have, um, like, they had a freight elevator to get up and down. And there were actually retail stores underneath it. And I was like, you're going to put 40, 50,000 gallons of water above these people's heads. You know, is your landlord going to allow that? And you know, you have to go through the whole thought process of what you're going to do with this. And I can't imagine putting a, a huge aquaponics system on the second floor of a, a 200-year-old mill building. So, why have a, a business plan? Um, by the way, this is the inside of our future uh, greenhouse. We purchased a um, 26 by 144 foot greenhouse that we're um, in the middle of uh, putting up. So why have a plan? Um, those of you that aren't going to self-fund uh, your setup, you're going to have to get funding someplace. So it's going to be at a bank, maybe a grant, um, or you know, basically a loan. I'm not a big fan of uh, borrowing money from friends and family. Um, my, I really like to self-fund, so don't, you know, basically put yourself in debt, borrow from yourself. If you're going to borrow from a bank, uh, they are definitely going to want to see what you're going to do with their money. They're not going to give you a, an unsecured loan unless you're going to pay a really high interest rate for that. Um, so having a business plan in place um, definitely helps secure some funding. Uh, it really will help keep you focused. You know, a lot of people come and say, I want to do aquaponics. Well, great. Oh, I'm going to grow lettuce. Oh, well, I, I just talked to somebody else, and they're growing, you know, herbs and spices. So, you know, you come up, keep yourself focused, and follow along that track. You can waste a lot of money uh, jumping back and forth with uh, with your plans. Whoops, did I just? No, oh, I guess that's all I had on that slide. Um, so these are just some quick of the main components of a business plan, um, and um, it really helps getting it in different sections and explaining to somebody, an investor, the banks, on what you're going to be trying to do. I like that strawberry. We grew that uh, in our place. Um, strawberries aren't a very good money maker, I don't think, in aquaponics, but I like to do them. They're quite tasty. So also, um, you'll see some 
miscellaneous examples of uh, stuff that we've ripped out of our plan uh, that we have. Basically, in the introduction, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. This is where you basically can brag about yourself and your accomplishments and how much you know uh, to whoever you're uh, trying to get some money from. And um, you know, take the time and really try to um, you know, say, hey, I know what I'm doing. Because you know, the more confident in an investor is in you, the, um, the more money or the lower the interest rates can be. Um, it's amazing what a bank will do. And you know, they can just slide those interest rate scales around based off of um, um, what, how much you know about the industry. I also have a quick product, project summary, nothing too exciting. We're going to be doing this and this uh, with this uh, project. And this can also help um, if you're applying for grants. A lot of the grants will want to know what your overall project is going to be. You want to have a mission. You know, what is it that you ultimately want to do with your business? You want to you know, help um, some, be a nonprofit and help with uh, certain areas. You want to make a lot of money, um, you know, grow. We, we put ours, uh, you know, top quality, naturally grown, fresh vegetables to local resellers and restaurants. Pretty simple. You know, that's, that's, that's your plan. Now this one, um, it's fairly important, obviously. What type of products are you going to sell? You know, stay focused with your products, um, depending if you're going to become a huge uh, company. You might want to do a monoculture crop, just grow the same lettuce and just be a massive assembly line for that lettuce. That's great. If you can, if you can do that, you can pick up a Costco or something. Um, most of the people here, they grow a lot of different crops um, just so that they can deal with the, um, the restaurants and whatnot. That's sort of one of my favorite things. And, um, these are uh, two of the, uh, the lettuce and the tomatoes that we grow in ours. We like to grow um, all heirloom uh, varieties, so we don't even do any of like, the, the Rex Apeltai seeds or anything like that. So um, you, know, you basically want to explain to people what you're going to be growing in your greenhouse. So you know, it's great to experiment. I have no problem with that. Um, but you should also stay focused on uh, what that product is that you're going to do. And uh, Tanya you know, talked about that. on. Uh, earlier about um, all the different varieties that they do and you know I think it's fantastic you know coming up with all that different stuff oh so what are your target markets Tani did a great job explaining all the P's of uh, marketing um, earlier and uh, talked about that a little bit who do you want to sell your products to you know, there's, there's a lot of different areas that you can sell into. Do I have different bullets? You have the CSA um, farm stands. Um, basically, um, they're becoming very popular. You can sell direct, uh, dictate higher margins. It's a great place to get rid of product. But downside is you are, um, in, at least in our area, one of the downsides is that you're pre-selling uh, your product for the year. Um, and if you have a really bad year on your farm, you can really screw over your customers and they don't, aren't too happy when you aren't giving them a, a huge package of um, produce every week. Farmers market, another great way to sell direct. Um, they do consume a lot of time. Um, if you have to travel any place to uh, sell your product and um, sometimes you can sell through your product. You bring a lot of extra product next time around. You might not sell enough the next uh, week that you're at the farmer's market. Um, in Connecticut, um, we're in the far northeast uh, corner of Connecticut. I know a few people that um, are dealing with farmer's markets. And because there's a lot of farms in our area, they can't get a, a top dollar uh, for it. So they'll, they'll actually pack up their vans and drive two, two and a half hours down close to New York City and they can get triple the price of their product down there. So it all depends on how much time you want to spend um, out of your day uh, to sell your products. So farmer markets are good, but um, can also be uh, quite time consuming. And I know a few uh, growers that have uh, finally have given up on uh, dealing with the farmer's markets. You can sell wholesale. Uh, again, very difficult. Um, and also, they can be a large percentage of your um, customer base. You know, you could, if you landed a wholesale or Whole Foods or you know, some other large uh, grocery store, they may consume or take all your product that you want. And then all of a sudden one day they're going to be like, oh, we don't want to deal with you anymore. We're going to go buy from this guy. And now you have a greenhouse full of product. So 
that can be a dangerous thing if you're uh, selling uh, to one large customer. Plus that wholesale pricing, you get a lot less uh, bang for your buck, um, but you're pushing a lot of material out. So there's, there's trade-offs with all of these. So again, you have to come up and work through the numbers on this. Restaurants are a great way uh, to sell your product, um, especially, you know, you can keep your product local. You don't have to worry about shipping it. Um, the restauranteurs love uh, getting all that fresh, uh, fresh food. So there is some marketing. I'm not a uh, marketing person. I'm probably one of the worst marketing people out there. But how do you market your product? Social media, it's free. It's fairly easy. You just have to deal with a lot of trolls that are out there. Um, but at least you can get your information out there. Um, when we advertise product, we usually do it through Facebook because they have a very good uh, targeted marketing. Um, you can put in, I want to you know, advertise towards you know, 25 to 46 year old males in, you know, in the Connecticut area. Um, through Google ads, little, it's okay through them, but Facebook seems to be a great way to do it, especially people start sharing information around. So social media is a good way, fairly economical way of uh, doing some advertising. Word of mouth, you can't beat word of mouth, if, especially if you're uh, selling through local areas. You, know, you get a couple of chefs, and Tanya uh, talked about that earlier. You get a local chef, they just start talking to each other. And all of a sudden, you have all the chefs in the, the various restaurants in the area. I mean, these guys, they're competing against the other, but you know, just like uh, some of us may compete against each other, but we're all friends, and you know, these chefs all know each other, and they move from restaurant to restaurant. And eventually, um, if you have a really good product, the word of mouth will get out, and um, will help, help sell, you, sell your products. And of course, there's good old-fashioned uh, advertising, um, print, radio, and social media is advertising. I put that in again because uh, that's a paid advertising versus just uh, regular um, trolling the social media. Um, again, <clears throat> print advertising is still very expensive for some reason, even though nobody reads a newspaper anymore. So I'm not a, a big fan of uh, print advertising. So another step of a business plan are your operational plans. Again, very important. How are you planning on running that operation? You know, if you wanted to set up a, a 10,000 square foot greenhouse, you're probably not going to be the only person in that greenhouse running it. So now you have to come up with a plan on how you're going to staff it, especially um, how often are you going to be harvesting material, your material, sorry, I'm thinking of inventory in my other uh, industry. Um, how often are you going to be uh, harvesting your um, produce, you know, all the scheduling on how, how you're going to run that business. Not so much of the business plan. This is usually in um, grants or for uh, bank loans is what's your financial position? If you're a current business and you're trying to expand it, the banks are going to want to know um, how much money are you currently making? Are you running at a loss currently? They may not want to know that. So, um, sorry, I had to gray out some of my own personal stuff in there. Um, but basically, how much money are you, have you made in the past? And um, will they loan you money? Or even with the grant, sometimes they want to make sure that you're going to be around to spend their money the proper way. So a little side note, um, and this is some example spreadsheets. I'm a big fan of Microsoft Excel, um, just for figuring out the numbers, but not for running the business. You don't want to use Excel to do your daily financials. It, it just won't work. However, if you're coming up with a project you got to get the numbers down on paper. And, and when Ryan was talking earlier, he hinted on it um, also, you know, coming up with the numbers. You can, you can basically run a business figuring it out on a spreadsheet if you come up and engineer that system and your market the right way. Um, very, very simple to do. I mean, this looks crazy complicated. But by typing and changing a couple of numbers really quickly, you'll know immediately if you're actually going to make any money or not. Uh, just as an example here, um, I think I put a head of lettuce in at $1.75, yep, right about there. Now, based off of this greenhouse setup, it showed the, um, the pre-loss revenue of uh, $91,000 um, for this particular setup. 
And there's some other calculations in there for crop loss and whatnot. Now, that's the revenue. You have to be careful. Somebody's going to say, hey, you're going to make $91,000 that year. No, you're not making $91,000. You're generating $91,000 of income. That doesn't include any of your expenses. So, you know, that's this column here. I have other expenses shown here at $61,000. Wait until you see how much it costs to heat a uh, greenhouse in the, the New England area. And this just showed a profit of $29,000. Now, if you took that head of lettuce at $1.75 and now you're selling to a wholesaler and they're going to pay you, what, a buck for a head of lettuce, $1.25? You drop these numbers down and all of a sudden your $91,000 of income could be $60,000 and now you're going to be running at a loss just by, by changing that. So just play around with the spreadsheets and you'll, you can come up pretty accurately on um, how much it's going to cost you to run that business. Also figure out your expenses. If you're going to be doing a build out of a new system, design that system accurately, draw it out, figure out you know, how many feet of piping you need, all your tanks, every elbow, ball valves. If you start buying ball valves, you're going to see they ain't cheap. And if you need 20 of those things, you're going to be hundreds and hundreds of dollars in just valves. And get them on a sheet, figure it out. Because then you could say, oh, yeah, it's going to cost me $30,000, $60,000 to do a build out on a greenhouse. And you know, numbers, numbers talk. I mean, it, it makes a huge, huge difference. And if you're not willing to spend the time figuring out your numbers, I'm telling you now, don't bother going into business. Figure out those numbers. So that's my side rant. Thank you. Another um, part that I like to do with the spreadsheets is um, figure out how long, how much money you're going to be spending over at least three years. First year, you usually plan at least not making any money. It takes a few other people have said in the past it's taken a couple of years to finally start making some money. So you want to come up with at least three years. I recommend a five-year cash flow plan um, to figure out how long it's going to be until you start making some money and maybe actually pay yourself. It gets even worse when you start borrowing money from a bank because not only are you starting in debt, you're also taking any of that profit that you have and paying off loans. And loans, you know, if anybody has bought a house and have, has actually gone through and run an amortization table through, Interest will suck up a lot of your cash. Um, again, that's why if you want to start a business, either start it smaller, try not to borrow whole much, too much money because it, it just, you know, being in debt really, really sucks. Usually, if you're borrowing money, again, it's a good part of your business plan. What's the schedule? How are you going to implement this? You know, in the spring of 2006, we'll break ground. You know, we're going to buy parts. Over the winter, we'll do this and that. So you just want to come up with a little schedule, figure out how long it's going to take you to do it. Because again, people come in and say, we're going to do this greenhouse. We're going to have it fully up and running in three months. No, you're not. I mean, just off the top of my head, you can tell that. So you know, figure out, yeah, it's going to take us so long to put up the frame of the greenhouse or cover the, the plastic or, you know, it's going to take us two months to do the build out of the NFT uh, system or DWC system. So, you know, it, it, you're helping yourself by putting down this information and it, it really is a reality check to, to come up with that plan to know what you're doing. This is a picture of the, the plan for our uh, setup. It's just an overview of, the, of three greenhouses. We're just going to start with one. So a little example there of uh, what it is. And that's just the overview. In our area, they're very strict with um, uh, wetlands regulations and whatnot. So we actually had to hire an engineer um, to um, at least do our site layout to make sure that we weren't encroaching on uh, any environmental issues. Ryan talked about it. You know, got to come up with a design. You don't want to just say, I'm going to go into business, and you start cobbling pieces together. You know, he talked about pump sizes, all your plumbing sizes, flow rates, everything. Come up with that part of the plan. And you know, based off of that, I mean, I can take this picture now and say, I need so many feet of piping. I need so much material of, uh, you know, Duraskrim, whatever. All the parts that I need can come off of that. 
It also, if you're trying to get money from a bank or whatnot, and they don't fully understand what aquaponics is or what you're really trying to do, a picture is worth a thousand words. You can say, here's what we're going to do. Here's the design of it. Hey, I actually know what I'm talking about. I can show you a design of what this thing is going to do. And the bankers are going to look at it and say, hey, this guy may actually do want to do it. And they'll write you your check, maybe. And lastly, just do a quick um, business plan in the conclusion. You just sort of, want, again, summarize uh, what you want to do and really uh, try to find good examples of other success stories. Obviously, if, um, if you're trying to run a business, trying to get some money from a bank, they're going to be like, who else has done this? So you, know, you can point them, you know, say, yep, Ken has done a great job. And I talked to Ryan Chatterson. I've known him for years. And I asked him, can I put a picture of your, your system in, uh, in my business plan when I'm working on uh, obtaining some money? And you know, he was gracious enough to allow me to do that. So I mean, a picture like that. Uh, can really uh, nail it home on uh, what you're trying to do. All right, so there's a few things that you want to plan for. This is um, our friendly local woodchuck uh, we had over the summer. I know some of you that watch my videos have probably uh, seen uh, my antics with the woodchuck. Um, and one night on this DWC bed, he wiped out 700 heads of lettuce, just like that. So. It basically crippled us uh, for lettuce production over the summer because you know you're trying to stagger your, your uh, lettuce growth, and he of course started with the biggest ones and worked his way down to the smallest one. Um, he had no problem hopping up onto that DWC bed and uh, cleaning it out. So there's these things, and you know Ryan again talked about it earlier. Every time he said something, I was like, I was going to talk about that. But um, you know there's things that you need to calculate in your, your, your plan. You know, figure out what your crop loss is going to be. You know, figure out if you're going to, you know, how, how often do you have a hurricane or a tornado go through and you may have to deal with crop loss. Or you buy crop loss insurance, which you can deal with that too. But obviously, uh, this woodchuck is no longer with us in, the, in his three other siblings. <clears throat> Uh, we had a horrible problem this year um, with our strawberries with some new variety of um, fruit flies that have uh, swept across the country. And um, this particular variety uh, wiped out the strawberries before they were even ripe. Usually you get the, f the fruit flies on the ripe stuff. But they were laying um, in the unripened fruit and we, you could actually see the, you know, the larvae coming out of the fruit at, before it was even ripe. So, uh, we had a 100% crop loss on the strawberries this year. It wasn't very pleasant, so there's two pests for you. Woodchucks and fruit flies. Um, what's your environment like? This is our, this is our typical winter in uh, Connecticut. So when you're coming up with your calculations uh, for a greenhouse or for your business in general, how do we deal with the weather? You know, for that large greenhouse that we're uh, we're putting in, we're planning on roughly $20,000 a year um, just to heat it with propane. It's a lot of money. So now you say, is it worth heating it or is it worth shutting it down and you know, watching the prices right over the winter because you, know, you have nothing else to do. And in, sadly, in our area, it's actually cheaper to just shut down your greenhouse than it is to heat it and uh, do lighting. It's, we just, we have, we'll get, two weeks um, without seeing the sun. We'll just have overcast skies for a couple of weeks. And you know, if you don't have light getting to your plants, they're not growing. Um, currently, we don't do any artificial lighting in our greenhouse, um, just a little bit of heating. And it's enough to keep the system um, from freezing. We keep our water temperatures around uh, 45, 50 degrees through the winter. Um, I'll usually plant a batch of lettuce in um, around Halloween or so. And we won't harvest that until mid-March. So you go the entire winter um, without producing any product. So now, if you want to go and drop tens of thousands of dollars on lights and extra heat to uh, produce lettuce. So you have to decide, do I just not want to do it over the winter? Do I want to do fresh produce over the winter, charge a premium for it because nobody else is bringing it in, or just allow them to keep trucking in organically grown lettuce from Arizona and California, which is the common thing in our area. 
Obviously, another problem is uh, not paying attention to your nutrients in the system. This is one of our lettuce. Uh, who knows what's wrong with it? Iron. iron. Very dead giveaway. Um, it's an iron deficiency. I had actually neglected uh, adding iron into our system for several weeks. I just zoned out and didn't do it. You know, so again, part of your operational plan is you know, put a chart up on the wall and put a calendar on it that, with the check marks in it to say, oh, I added iron this week, or however often you're going to do it, three weeks, some people like to do. Um, so you know, simple things like that will save your crop. You know, if I lost an entire crop of lettuce just because I forgot to put iron in, in the system. Some other thoughts. Our friend uh, Uncle Sam, he wants your money. And um, I don't want to uh, dwell too much on it, but um, you want to reinvest your profits. Um, I don't want to say, tell you to skirt having to pay a lot of taxes, but I'm going to give you an example. You know, last year, we had a very good year uh, selling the grow grip. So we had you know, a fairly profitable year. And I basically was banking that money so that we could reinvest it into building the new greenhouse. Unfortunately, I held that reinvestment um, into the new year. And we had to pay out roughly $5,000 in extra taxes because we did not reinvest that money back into our own uh, company. We didn't spend the money. So Uncle Sam, he sees it as just pure profit. And you get taxed on that. Um, if you reinvest that, you know, do some new build out or something like that, that's an expense into the business and it's not showing us as profitable. So, you know, it almost sounds like Donald Trump up here talking about not paying his taxes, but that's essentially what you're doing. You're legally not paying taxes. You just want to, you know, put that back in yourself because if you're not going to spend the money on yourself, you're going to give it to Uncle Sam and he's going to, you know, who knows what they do with it. But, I'm not going to get into the political rants on it, but you really should um, try to minimize what your business looks like um, it's generating in profits. Just you know, try to keep it running right at zero, essentially. Tax accountant. I know we, hate, we all hate spending money, especially on weird professional services. I strongly recommend um, getting a tax accountant because if I do have one, I should have, you know, Sometime in November, I should have said, hey, we've made this much money this year. And he would have said, yeah, I recommend you spending on this or writing it off or you know, paying yourself some extra. And uh, by the way, if you pay yourself extra money out of your profits, it's not an expense and you'll still be paying taxes on it. So um, there's, a, there's a bunch of other uh, stuff. But you know, simple tax account costs you a few hundred bucks a year. Um, and it, it makes a big difference, at least I think so, by um, having um, an accountant or at least a CPA do your taxes for you every year. Um, it's sure nice having that stamp on the bottom of your tax form saying a CPA did your taxes versus doing it to you personally so you don't have uh, the IRS knocking on your door for an audit. It reduces that uh, risk substantially. Um, I talked earlier, you know, use Microsoft Excel for doing some of your general calculations. Invest 250 bucks in QuickBooks. It's not going to kill you. And it's really important to make sure you have a good understanding of your income and expenses. Just, you know, you put in how much I sold in lettuce this week. You can figure out some profit information. You know what you did in revenue. So just suck it up and buy a little bit of software. Learn how to use it. QuickBooks is easy to use. You can use it for farming. I don't know what uh, some of my other peers uh, like to use. Um, but, you know, you should um, try to run your business. You do not want to just you know, try, start pocketing cash all the time on every sale and not keep track of what it is because when it's finally time to come back and do all your taxes and reinvest your profits, you need to know how much money you're, you're making. Time management's important. When you're running a farm, you're really not running a farm, you are running a business. You want to treat it like a business. The majority of your time is going to be spent running that business. If you want to be just having a great time planting and seeding, you're not running a business. That's, you know, just a small percentage of that is doing the farming part. You're going to be spending a lot of time, you know, dealing with sales, dealing with your customers for, you know, restaurants and whatnot. Um, you'll be dealing time with marketing. If you're going to be doing a website, you have to spend some time doing that. 
So make sure your, your time is planned out properly. You know, even if you have to set up a schedule with you every week, you know, every Friday afternoon at 2 o'clock, I'm going to start paying all my bills. Because if you don't do your time management, you're just going to, you know, I like to do it, hang out in the greenhouse, watch the fish, and, you know, pick aphids off the leaves or something. So you've got to make sure your um, uh, time is managed properly. Don't forget, farms do not take vacations. You may want to take a vacation, but your fish and your plants, they don't like to take vacations. They're going to keep growing, living, and dying. So if you want to take time off, you need to make sure that you have somebody available to help you run your farm. I mean, it's plain and simple. If, you, if you're going to walk away from your farm and something goes wrong, you get um, a fish stuck in one of your pipes or something like that, and you're off in Bermuda for the week, that system's going to fail, no doubt about it. So make sure that you have um, a backup plan in place uh, for your staff. I know a lot of the people that have the farms here, they've all been talking to their, their crews at home. You know, I'm standing with them, and they're like, yeah, so-and-so called, they got something plugged in their system. So you have to take that into account with your expenses on your business is that you're going to have staff or family member, and hopefully you can trust them to make sure that they're going to feed your fish and, and make sure there's no failures in the system. So the farms don't take a vacation. My cousin's a dairy farmer. He does not take vacations. He gets up in the morning, milks his cows, goes works on the farm, at night goes and milks the cows again. He just cannot leave that farm. He's, he's married to it. This is more of a recommendation. Um, when you're starting off a business, I like to keep a separate set of books for my financial, my personal financial stuff so that you can um, really keep track of your income and expenses. Um, Bigelow Brooks and LLC, the taxes are filed as one entity personally, um, but we still keep a separate set of books so our tax accountant you know, does our books and then files our taxes as one thing. You just you don't want to start dipping into your personal checking account when you're writing out checks. Keep two bank accounts, one for personal, one for business. As you get larger or start expanding, it's just it's it's just better off. There's there's just so many reasons to make sure that it you keep that separate. So you don't have to incorporate. A lot of people will just you know doing business as and they they just own the business personally, but incorporating just helps keep things a little bit segregated better. As you know, we produced the grow grips. We made those up a, a few years ago. I think you all had them in your, your packages and uh, the raft masters um, that we uh, also sell. Um, and that's about it. If, you know, if you're thinking about running a business, it's a great idea. I've done a business in the past. We've been running Bigelow Brook uh, since 2002 is when we purchased the property and incorporated it. That plan is important. I, I just can't stress it enough is coming up with a plan on how, how you want to run it. Just don't, don't do it fly by night. You won't succeed at it. You think you might be able to and remember everything that you need to do. It, it just won't happen. You've you got to write it down. You have to work. If you have any partners, agree to what you want to do with that and just you know, stay focused with it. That's all I have. Any questions? Um, we started the farm, um, we purchased the farmland from my cousin, he had a dairy, he has the dairy farm, um, he needed cash for the dairy farm so we bought the land and we immediately put it into the LLC and most of it was for insurance reasons because we allowed them to continue uh, farming, they use it to, to grow uh, corn and uh, other uh, silage foods and we wanted to make sure that is if somebody from his farm got hurt he can't sue us personally. So it's really to keep that segregation. And even if um, you do an LLC for a business, if the business gets sued, in most cases they can't go after your um, house or other personal uh, property. So that's one reason why um, I recommend uh, separating off to a separate LLC. If you get bigger, then it's usually you know, a different type of uh, company. But LLCs are perfectly fine for most small farms. They'll usually sue your business, and it, they they can. You know, I've been sued before. In fact, I'm currently being sued for something else. I'm a a, a selectman in our town and on the wetlands commission, and we get sued uh, every once in a while for the work that we do within the town, and then they go us after us personally. Thankfully, the town has insurance. 
you know, that's another thing I probably should put a, bu put a bullet in, have insurance. You know, the town has insurance and their attorneys pay for all the lawsuits that we have to deal with. Um, so, you know, have some type of liability coverage, especially if you're going to uh, be giving farm tours, you're going to have people wandering around your property. If somebody trips on a, you know, piece of piping that's sticking out of the floor in your greenhouse, chances are they'll probably sue you over it or at least contact their insurance company and let the two insurance companies uh, deal with the settlement. You know, if there's any money on the table, somebody's going to try to grab it from you. Do you have insurance for your produce as far as like if you sell it and somebody got sick? Um, it's, it's, we have an umbrella policy with the farm. We don't sell um, the majority of our lettuce um, to the general public. Um, I, I do have a full-time job working elsewhere, so I actually pack up all my stuff, bring it to the office. We're in the, and we're at, our office is in a uh, suburban area um, outside of Boston, and I can sell everything from there. They're just so excited to get it. It's just easy for me to pack it up. So, you know, that's my customer base. My, my main customer base is, is the grow grips and, uh, and, and whatnot, and some private consulting that I don't usually talk too much about. Um, so the insurance is an umbrella policy. We do have, our insurance policy covers us personally and the business because our house is on the adjacent property. We actually subdivided out the farm property from the house property to keep it completely separate. You gotta, you gotta keep your personal life separate from the business life. Any other questions? Nothing else? I got lots of questions. Well, you can keep asking. <laughs> I don't know how we're on time. Three twelve. So we're right on time. Any other questions? Hey, Rob, how yes. Do you use the Facebook? Can you explain that a little more for your market? Sure. You know, we have a separate Facebook uh, page for Bigelow Brook, you know, so everybody has their personal one and then usually set up a separate, you know, business page within Facebook. So a lot of times we just post pictures and general junk about what's happening. And then um, when you do a, a Facebook post, it usually says, you know, monetize this post after you do the post. And so you can click on that and it'll be like, oh, I want to spend $30 on this post as an advertisement. And what it will do is it will tell you, um, it will ask you keywords. So say I want to make this advertisement go towards anything with the word aquaponics in it or if, if other people out there have aquaponics as their interest. And then it will say for that $30, we'll put that post in front of 10,000 people. And then you can actually refine it and say, oh, I, I want that 10,000 people to be you know, from the age of 25 to 80. And it'll say, all right, that's going to reach 25,000 people or 40,000 people. So it'll actually tell you how many people um, will get an impression with that Facebook post. What kind of response have you had? For me, it's usually fair to poor. Um, when we did the, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Facebook. Um, yeah, you know, we had good responses. Um, we actually did a, a quick advertisement when we did the tour to tanks. Um, I just sucked it up and paid like 25 bucks. I think I had a coupon with Facebook. Every so often they'll send a coupon out. If you, if you advertise once, then they want to get you again, so they'll send you a, a little a coupon. Um, I think I spent like 25 bucks on that. And um, when people came to visit the farm, they would actually say how they found out about us, whether it was like from a mailing or from Facebook. And we had a lot of people say that they, they saw the ad on Facebook. So it really uh, depends. You know, I've spent money advertising with Amazon uh, for the grow grips and they don't allow you to actually target your audience. They figure out who they think is your target market and they had sent me like a coupon for $150 in free advertising. So I was like, well, it's free ads. I might as well do it. And they actually have very good statistics on how many impressions, you know, and an impression is how often that ad is just shown on a screen. It doesn't mean anybody looked at it. It's just they put it onto the screen for you to look at. And um, so we had tens of thousands of impressions. It would say how often somebody clicked on it. And then it would say how often after that click did somebody purchase. And so I was like, oh, great. We got all these impressions. And it showed you know, we got 300 clicks. And then you get to the last one. It said, oh, there were two purchases off of that. And of course, they purchased, whoever purchased it bought like a pack of the 25 grow grips. And you know, the selling price of that's $9 or something. So for that $150 in advertising revenue, I think we had proof that we had purchased or sold two items off of that. So 
Spending money on advertising is an extremely risky process. You, you, it may not be an instant gratification. A lot of times people advertise just to keep in front of other people, so it's, a, it's more of a longer term investment. But advertising, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, you know, it's difficult for me, I'm not an advertising person. I know there are people, you know, their whole career is obviously advertising. And you know, I don't have what it takes to be a good advertiser. Yeah, at least with Facebook. Yeah, with Facebook and you know Amazon or Google, you can at least see the statistics on what it is. You know, if you're advertising in a newspaper, you, all they can tell you is what their circulation is. You have no idea if anybody's reading it. I mean, I don't read ads in the newspaper. I don't even read the newspapers. It's like who wants to deal with that anymore? So, you know, it, there's. It, it really is a magic uh, to being able to do a, a good advertising campaign. I mean, we did advertising campaigns. We did a Kickstarter a few years ago with a project. You know, mixed revolt, results with advertising. We did most of it through Facebook just to, because we could see the statistics. You know, I'm an engineer. I want to see the numbers. I don't want to just do some black magic on uh, what's happening with advertising. Is there somebody over here? No? Just, just itching your back and making sure you're okay. Good. Um, I don't have enough crops uh, to deal with crop loss insurance. Um, my my cousin that's doing most of the farming on our property with for his a dairy farm, he has crop loss insurance. I have a, um, another relative in town. They have a, um, a very large apple orchard. It's one of the larger ones in the area. They had almost 100% crop loss this year because we had a really late uh, frost and it killed all their apple blossoms. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.